If you're enjoying Cowboy Crossroads and would like to help me keep it going, you can become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is an online platform that allows you to offer monthly support to creative projects that you enjoy. You can find more info and become a patron at patreon.com slash cowboy crossroads. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cowboy crossroads. I'd like to thank my trail boss patrons, Bob Kelly, Chris Ryden, and Scott Anderson. I'd like to start today's show with a poem written by today's guest, Jay Snyder. This piece is entitled, Of Horses and Men. Some are blessed with tranquil passing, while others met a tragic end. Truth is, it's never easy when you've lost a trusted friend. As horses go, it's sometimes told in simple words that cowboys use. He darn sure was a good one. He's the kind you hate to lose. He's the kind you'd ride the river with, roam the canyons and the breaks. In rough country and wild cattle, he'd be the one you'd take. His efforts weren't ruled by stature. With him, you'd finish what you'd start. His limits were governed only by the dimension of his heart. His expectations were simple, merely fairness from a friend. But when he'd feel the need to run, don't try to fence him in. Pure poetry in motion as across the plains he'd fly, a tried and true compadre in a seasoned cowboy's eye. His courage was unmatched by mortal men, from conquistadors to kings. Cowboys sing his praises at roundups in the spring. Ain't it strange how thoughts of horses lost mirror those of men passed on? And though they've gone to glory, their spirit's never gone. Sometimes simple words seem best when final words we choose. He darn sure was a good one. He's the kind you hate to lose. Howdy folks, this is Andy Hedges, and you're listening to Cowboy Crossroads. On each episode, I interview a different guest and ask them to share stories and discuss music, poetry, and culture from the working cowboy west and beyond. My guest today is Jay Snyder. Jay Snyder is a rancher, a former bull rider, and a poet. Jay is from southwestern Oklahoma and was born to a ranching and rodeo family. He has appeared at many of the cowboy poetry gatherings across the West and is currently serving as the Poet Laureate for the state of Oklahoma. I sat down with Jay during the Winsboro Cowboy Music and Poetry Gathering in Winsboro, Texas and recorded this interview. Here's Jay Snyder. You know, actually, I was uh, born and raised southwest Oklahoma. I was born in a little town, Walters, southeast of us, there about 50 miles. And and my mother and her sisters and uh, were from that area. My granddad was a he was on the police force there in the, in Walters in the 50s, and so he had a you know a, a law enforcement background to a certain degree uh we my my dad actually came to our part of the country back in the 40s late 40s he was living they were living in uh roswell new mexico and his dad was the wagon boss on the oasis ranch out there around roswell he broke the mules and the horses to the wagon, and so he had a pretty good uh, stretch there with the Oasis Ranch. Uh, Dad worked uh, as a young man for the Anchor D 
out there around Roswell Hondo area. I can remember uh, some stories from that era that my mother had told me, but um, before we go there, I'll tell you that I, I lived in Surreal, Oklahoma, for my pretty much my entire life. You know, went to school there at Surreal and graduated high school there. Went to uh, from that point, I went to uh, college at Southwestern Oklahoma State University and. In Weatherford, actually got the very first uh, rodeo scholarship that Southwestern gave away way back in the day. Uh, Doc Mitchell was the rodeo coach coach at the time, and he came. Of course, my brother, my older brother Monty, was going to school there a year prior to me, two years prior to me. So he and Doc knew each other, and so Doc came up and offered me this scholarship to be on a rodeo team at Weatherford. So I took it, and at that time, uh, the rodeo team wasn't uh, hardly recognized through the school as a, an athletic event or anything of, of sorts. But we had some good times. We made a few rodeos and some things like that, but I was honored to to have been asked to be on the team and Monty, my older brother was on the team, but there are six of us kids, uh, mother and, and my dad married in about 1948 and dad came from New Mexico, him and a couple of friends of his came to New Mexico rodeoing and they came to Walters. Walters rodeo was going on and another little, Rodeo out back to the east there at Comanche was going on, so they were making some rodeos. And my mother told me that dad got in the bull riding, got hurt in the bull riding, and broke his collarbone. And her dad, my granddad, they loaded him up, took him back to their house, and and uh, let him heal up for a few days. And uh, my mother told me that she put some. Uh, I'm not for all that familiar with it, but she called it caustic balsam on that broken collarbone, wrapped it up pretty good. And evidently, when you wrap that stuff up, it it uh, causes some pretty major burns. So anyway, Dad not only had to heal from the broken collarbone, he had to heal from the burns that the caustic balsam gave him for the, a few days there so. She uh, she still still tells that story and and you can see a grin come on her face about every time that she tells that story and I I don't understand that but that's the way it, <laughs> that's the way it is <laughs> but uh, anyway there's in our family there's four boys two girls I've got two sisters um, I've got three brothers we've all been involved in in the. Uh, you know, the horse business, the rodeo side of the deal. Dad rodeoed forever from way back in the early days, right on up through the old timers associations and and won I don't know, he won eight or ten saddles in that old timers association and during the time he was rodeoing. What all events was he competing in? When he first came to our part of the country he was working all all five events in the actually in the RCA at that time uh, he, he rode bulls and barrack horses bulldog rope calves rope steers uh, he did all the events now you know that's before I came along so it's yet to be determined how great a cowboy he was in all five events but but he he turned out to be one of the best greatest ropers that came out of our part of the country so after we came along well he kind of quit riding bulls and and rough stock and and uh quit bulldogging so mainly he just rope calves and team rope rope steers and he did some some single steer roping for a time but and in, in that day and time there weren't wasn't a lot of single steer ropings in our part of the country so we did i remember going to Pawhuska one one year with him when he was in a 
steer roping up there. But like I say, there weren't many steer ropings in our country, so he just continued to rope calves and and rope steers. But and was he was he ranching as well? Were you growing up in the ranching business? We we always ran some cattle. Uh, not large amounts of cattle because it's just so hard to put very much country together in our part of the country. The the land run uh, 1889 and the lottery kind of put into big places in our part of the country is all cut up in small 160 acre parcels. And from that point, why well, they'd sell a 40 off or sell an 80 off or sell, you know, so pretty hard to put together much country and down there where we're at but we always ran some ca- some some calves and cows and always had a bunch of horses he was always buying horses from a lot of times off the track that couldn't run enough to really win on the track so he'd bring them home and we'd try to make roping horses out of them so but we always ran you know a, li- a little dab of, of cattle during the time but he mainly made his living in the dirt business he was an uh he could run any kind of excavation machinery that that was around he he started out running a drag line uh when he was 14 years old out there in new mexico and drag line's a big old crane that kind of has a bucket out on the end of it and he'll sling it out there and get a load of dirt and pull it back to him, spin it around and dump it off to the side. But he, he worked a lot on the, on road crews and different, uh, excavation jobs around state jobs. Uh, and so that's where he pretty much made his living. He rodeoed on the side and that was his hobby, but he pursued it pretty hard there for a while, but always, you know, kept the, the dirt jobs going. My mother's dad, uh, actually from down Walters area, south east of Lawton, and they were around there for uh, uh, all the time. That before Dad come into that country, that's where they were living at, at Walters. And mother went to school there. Her sisters went to school. In that area, there was some uh, small country schools at the time, but they ended up in the Walters area. And my so my granddad on my mother's side was uh, on the police force there at at Walters, and then oh, in the fifties, he got the opportunity to go to work for the Texas and Southwestern Cattle Raiders Association as a brand inspector. And so his his area was southwest Oklahoma, the southwest quadrant, I'll say, of Oklahoma. That was his area that he covered, and and it was his job to, you know, if a uh, farmer, rancher, whoever had something stolen, well, they'd contact the association, and it was his job to go investigate and try to get the properties back or found out, find out who had stole the cattle or whatever it was. And and he worked for them for about 25 years. Actually was one of the, they had a little program going. Uh, the association had a program where if the inspectors got new members in their work, why well, they had a little program going where they would, give away hats or some things, you know, for guys that brought in more membership. So, and he won that several times. He was a, he was a people person. He loved visiting with people. And I think part of the reason that he actually, after I studied about it for a good bit, uh, I think that actually the, the reason he kind of wanted to go to work for the Cattle Raiders Association so it could be around those kind of people, horse people and cattlemen and because he he was a horse trader. He loved trading. Well, not only horses, but he traded cattle and horses and a lot of different things, and he just loved being around those kind of people. So it fit right in with his job, and, and he had, while he was investigating a crime somewhere, while he would meet somebody new, and, and they'd have a little band of horses or they'd have a little herd of cattle, and 
so they'd get to visit and maybe do a little trading around. And so he, he really enjoyed uh, that job and, and the people that he got to deal with. I had the opportunity growing up to, to go with him a lot on his job. And so I got the opportunity to meet a lot of people through that organization. I met some of the finest people that I've ever met in my entire life. Uh, in that organization, I, I got to meet Don King, who was general manager for the Cattle Raiders Association for a lot of years, and and of course Manfred Elliott was a, always a hero of mine. He and my granddad worked a lot together because Manfred's area was over uh, North Texas, uh, the ranch country, the sixties, and uh, Pitchfork, and a lot of those ranches. So he. That was his area, but he and Granddad would work a lot together, and and my Granddad was some older than Manfred was, so I think they mentored each other a little bit, and so I got to meet Manfred and 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 his family, and that was that's been a blessing. Uh, Cotton Elliott and Bob and Bill and all of those folks, uh, the the girls Becky and Cindy, they were they were good friends, and we we enjoyed getting to know them over the years. But I remember going to, uh, after Don King, who was a general manager there for a lot of years when my granddad was an inspector, when he passed away, they had his funeral at, at German, Texas, and, and we went to the services. And I remember all those inspectors coming in, and they all dressed pretty much the same, white shirts, ties, uh, khaki breeches, and and it was it was really a neat deal to see though because they'd have six pallbearers six honorary pallbearers and they're all standing there and they all dressed alike and it was a pretty neat picture i wished i could have painted it at the time but for me it was a blessing to get to meet those kind of people growing up and and be around them uh after uh, i got a little older of course dad in the rodeo business, you know, he we traveled with him nearly all the time, going to rodeos and ropings. And back in those days when I was young, well, uh, we'd go to those little old ropings. They called them, and, and that, back in the day, they called them shodeos. They were just little old punk and rolling ropings that uh, they'd have. I, I remember an old friend that bought an old gymnasium in in Lake Valley, Oklahoma, which is north and west of us a little ways, and we'd go to that and turn that indoor gymnasium into a little roping arena. And so we'd go to his rodeos or showdios and dad rope calves, and he'd have little calf ridings and junior roping and just <clears throat> a lot of different things that we got to attend, and so that's kind of where I got started riding calves and roping and the whole nine yards. I, I actually roped calves early, and uh, my brother and I both roped calves, and and uh, Granddad was instrumental in, in keeping us some little old horses and calves, and my, my dad helped us, and so we roped a lot in our early years and then as I got a little older well uh, I don't know whether I just decided I wasn't going to rope calves anymore I was just going to ride bu- ride bulls and so I roped a little along kept roping and but uh, mainly I was riding bulls and and I don't know whether it was because I just didn't feel like the calf roping deal was going to work or whether I was, wasn't good enough to to win or just what, but I I rode bulls there for a long time, 25 years I think, of riding bulls and and I I wouldn't take for the memories. I loved riding bulls and I and I wouldn't take for the memories of when we were going down the road. But I'm old enough now that I've gained enough sense. I don't want to do it anymore. You know, it was fun. It was a lot of fun, and and I met a lot of folks. And it's kind of the same way. Kind of the same way it is in the rodeo business as it is in this poetry business. You know, the same. 
you kind of have a family. We had a family, a rodeo family that we traveled with and knew, and we'd see them at every rope in their rodeo. And it's kind of the same way in this poetry deal. You know, we've kind of got a family that we see pretty regular, and and it's they have the same camaraderie that that the the rodeo people that I grew up with had, and, and that that means a lot to me. This day and time, the camaraderie we've lost some of that in the rodeo business now. But but I know it's because it costs a lot of money to go down the road. And back in those early days, there was just a you had a sense of we weren't there to take each other's money. We were there to compete, and we competed more against the animal than we did the other competitors. You know and 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 it's still that way uh, quite a bit this day and time in the rodeo but but the camaraderie that that we had back in those early days was was much higher than than it is this day and time and I know it's because of like you say the change that's happened you know it you need to get somewhere else to another rodeo and it, and you don't have time seems like to have that camaraderie that we used to have but meeting some of the old timers from way back in the day even before I really started rodeoing much my dad rodeoed with those old timers in the old timers association and 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 those guys were were the champions that you saw 20 years prior to seeing them in the Old Timers Association, those guys were were world's champions uh, back in their day and just transitioned from from that to the Old Timers Association because they didn't want to lose that camaraderie. They didn't want to lose the the part of getting to compete and ride good horses and, and do what they always did. So in a way, I really kind of, I miss those old days, but but I know that things have to change, and hopefully uh, they won't change to the point that that camaraderie won't, won't carry forth from now on. I, I, I think, I've thought about it a lot, I think a lot of that camaraderie uh, came from as far back as the trail drive days because there was a, there was a guy named Luther A. Lahan wrote a poem called The Good Old Cowboy Days and and that poem talks about the camaraderie that those men had in that short period twenty year period of time that they drove cattle up the trails. It wasn't about the dangers that they had to face. It was about the camaraderie they forged in those years of driving cattle up the trail and taking care of each other and trying to just trying to survive and and I think that same camaraderie and carried forth from even the trail drive days to the to this day and time when uh especially folks in the western persuasion you know the rodeo and the ranch rodeos and the ranching that camaraderie I think actually a lot of it came from back in those trail drive days so I feel pretty blessed that I got to live through the old days and and now into the new and the guys today they're I won't say they're not they're they're not cowboys they're cowboys but they're more athletes than they are ranch cowboys I'll say and they're riding better horses and they're you know they study their what's going on and they they know how to make it work where back in the early days we just if we could just get there we felt pretty blessed so it's been a fun been it's been a lot of fun well i think probably some of the what i really remember learning from my granddad and those guys uh look a man in the eye and shake his hand and being truthful is so important in whatever you do it doesn't make any difference what you're doing or 
how you're doing it. It's it's uh, doing what's right and and being truthful about what's going on. And I learned a lot of that from from my granddad and the, and the men that I got to to meet through that association because they were all that away. I, I, Manfred Elliott was one of the greatest men I ever knew, and, and it didn't make any difference what those kind of men told you to be that away. And that's kind of what we need to, what I have patterned my life after is to try to be straightforward and honest and, and uh, try to keep some of those old traditions that those men live by, kind of try to keep them coming forward and try to pass it on to the the next generation because without it we're we're in big trouble and i've not been around those guys the the new inspectors and some of those guys since my granddad's time but i've been to the museum in fort worth and and uh, a lot of those men are in that museum uh, along with my granddad and and you can see the things that meant a lot to those guys. It's it's just being straightforward and and doing th- doing things the right way. I think is the probably what I learned more than anything from those guys is to is to be straightforward. When you hear Jay Snyder talk about the values he picked up from his father and his grandfather and that old generation, you can see the influence that those old timers have had on Jay's poetry. Here's an excerpt from his poem, Four Little Words. Four little words have stuck in my mind from the time I was just a small child. There's a good feller, is what he would say when he talked of the men he admired. I remember those men he talked about, sure enough cowboys, tough, but kind. They said what they meant and meant what they said. These men are getting harder to find. There's a good feller, meant he was true to his word. That's all you expect of a man. You knew for sure he was proud to meet you by the genuine shake of his hand. There's a good feller meant you could depend on this man no matter the task. Never got too tough, too cold, or too late. For his help, all you need do is ask. I didn't care much for poetry in in high school, and probably because I wasn't reading the right kind of poetry, but I remember going to Abilene to the Western Heritage Classic way back there 25, 30 years ago. Made it out there to the chuck wagons and uh, uh, got to hear some poetry and some cowboy music, and I thought, boy, now that's that's a pretty neat deal, you know. And I thought, you know, I've grown up around this kind of stuff and learned those old sto- heard those old stories and learned some things from some of those old-timers, and... And it's all about the stories, in my opinion. It's the stories that are important and and keeping those traditions and those stories alive. And so that's kind of where I wanted to start was just to keep the stories alive and keep those traditions going. And so I, I had no idea if I could write one. So I just kind of sat down and started trying to write put some of those stories to rhyme and some of them turned out and some of them didn't and but then I got interested in in reading in the classic poetry the poets Kiskaden and you know S.O. Moore Barker and some of the classic poets from way back in the past and I fell in love with, with the way they write because it's a whole different vernacular back then than what it is this day and time and I just fell in love with the classic poetry and how they wrote it and those men those men lived those poems and 
And, and we do too. We, we still do. But they would had a way of writing and putting their thoughts to rhyme. Red Steagall is another example of that classic poetry. He has such a knack for for putting words together and lines together. And, and I can follow that story all the way from start to finish. And that makes a lot of difference to me. Kiskadden, Bruce Kiskadden is a poet that writes, wrote a lot of good poetry, and it fits me a little better than some of the other do, others do, but he lived a lot of that, what he wrote about, and that makes a lot of difference to me that, that you actually, they lived what they wrote about. My poetry, I still today try to, and I'm not a prolific writer, but I try to be as true to the traditions in the cowboy way of life as I possibly can because that's what I'm what I want my kids and my grandkids to to read out of my poetry is is the the true traditions the true things that that come out of this cowboy way of life and and so I try real hard to to stay true to those traditions and forms of poetry so uh, hopefully I've gotten that accomplished actually I didn't in my day and time I didn't hear a lot of guys reciting poetry or uh, writing poetry but through the last 12-15 years I have learned that there was guy there were guys writing poetry back then. They just didn't they just didn't tell anybody they were writing it. They wrote it. But now that they've gotten a little older, they they're kind of bringing some of those poems out of the shoe boxes and reciting them and showing people that hey, I've been writing this kind of stuff for twenty years or better. But but as far as there was a few a few guys that were writing some stories and or at least telling a few of the stories but in my day and time I don't remember very few that were writing poetry or reciting poetry at that time but I have learned that it was happening they just didn't wasn't going to let anybody know that they were doing it I guess was the the big deal but the stories that I remember all, all the old bull riders from way back in my day, you know, we still, when I see some of those guys, we still relive the stories of the past. You know, I'm, uh, I've been out of that game for a long time, but some of the old, the old guys that I rode bulls with way back in the day, you know, if we ever see each other get together, well, we immediately go back to those days and, and so and so's bull over here. I remember him. Bull riders are kind of funny. They'll remember way back thirty years ago one they rode, and they can tell you how much they marked on him, and you know what he did. And they might not can tell you their second cousin's name, but they can tell you that bull's name and and what he did and how much he marked on him. And it, it's a it's a funny deal. But and and those guys. Back in my day of riding bulls, is a whole lot different than it is this day and time because uh, of the bulls that are, those guys are hauling down the road. You know, every contractor that we went around and have two or three, the sure enough, rank bulls in his pen. But this day and time, they'll bring a truckload of those sure enough rank bulls to a bull riding. And back in my day, it, there was a lot of bull riders back in my day. But if you were into bull riding and you and you won, you had to ride something pretty good and using pretty good to to make those scores reflect what you did. But this day and time, especially in the amateur rodeo, there's not as many bull riders going down the road as there used to be for whatever reason, maybe it's cost too much money or it's too costly to learn to go go into a rodeo to practice and learn how to ride and paying your fees going to rodeo. So 
it's it's a whole different deal. But now the if you can ride it all, you're going to those bull ridings that pay a lot of money. And so those guys are getting on some sure enough rank bulls and and uh, so it's a whole different whole different the bull riding has changed considerably in the last 25 years. I've talked to a guy, a friend, old bull rider friend of mine, oh, a year or so ago, and and he showed up at a rodeo, and we got to visiting about riding bulls back in our day. And and the first thing he said was, you and I are the only only two guys that ever rode that, that black bull that, F and F Rodeo Company used to haul, and I said, "Well, I, I I remember riding him, but I didn't know, you know, how many times he'd been ridden." He said, "Oh no, and you and I are the only two that ever rode that bull." But he said, "I had my feet tied in that rope, and you didn't, so I really didn't ride him." So, and but he remembers stuff like that, and I didn't, you know, I had no idea. But it's funny; I can remember way back in the day on bulls that I got on and rode and and can remember the town for the most part that that I rode him and wh- whether I placed or what I placed or whether he bucked me off or what but it's kind of a neat deal this it's it's about the stories you know it's uh, my opinion that's that's kind of what this poetry is about so it's about the stories are there one or two rides for you that just stand out when you look back at your well career? yeah they're actually that the one i was talking about there that uh, black bull like they, they called him number 33 big black high horn bull and really really bucked and i rode him at cordell won the bull riding on him in cordell oklahoma and i don't remember what i scored but a relative, I got him rode and, and won the bull riding, but he was the bull that that this guy was talking about. That he got him rode. I, I think he told me he rode him at Frederick, and but he had his he kind of had a had some knot holes in his in his rope. Had his spurs hung in the knots in his bull rope. So basically, what he was telling me that he cheated him a little bit to get him rode, but. Uh, Several several rides that I, I I won the bull riding at Duncan one year Duncan Oklahoma one year on a little old bull that Dwight Frick used to haul number thirty is what they called him and and he he really bucked and I'm, luckily made a pretty good ride on him on the bull riding. One of the things that probably stands out more in my mind than anything back in the day when I was riding. And I was kind of an old timer. I was on my way out. Uh, Lane Frost used to come down in our country and and get, enter some of those amateur rodeos before he really made it big in the PRCA. He'd come down to our part of the country and get on, you know, enter some of those amateur rodeos. And so I got the opportunity to meet this kid and good kid, and he knew I was older i mean you could tell i was older than him he's probably 16 maybe 17 years old at the time and so the rodeos that we'd both be at he'd come around ask me if i'd pull his bull rope and some things and and that meant a lot to me and especially after he got to be such a such a world's champion bull rider but but good kid very very polite good kid and those memories mean a lot to me so do you remember the last one you got on oh absolutely (laughs) yeah the last bull i got on and i wasn't even entered in the rodeo was there at my hometown rodeo in surreal and we always worked the rodeo we'd go help the contractor whatever you know help put the rodeo on and and I hadn't even entered the rodeo because I was really my my two boys was getting old enough that I, I was trying to deter them from maybe riding bulls. So I thought, well, you know, that I better quit or they're going to say, well, you did it, so I'm going to do it. And 
But anyway, I wasn't entered into bull riding, and, and we went to, it was a three-day rodeo at that time, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night, and I, I go to the rodeo on Thursday night, and they don't get a bull road. So I go to the rodeo on Friday night, and they don't get a bull road. And the contractor's name was Dwight Frick. And so I show up Saturday evening before they, even before they draw the bulls, and they still hadn't had a bull road. And I told Dwight, I said, God, I need to go home, just get my sack and bring it back. And he said, go get it, I'll put you in. So I decided, well, one more time. I went home and got my war bag and come back and, and he had entered me in a in the bull riding and and I I don't know if, maybe if it was coincidence or just what it was but I had drawn a bullock he called J seven which was a pretty good size he looked like it kind of colored like a jersey but he wasn't no horns but really he he really jumped high and and he was pretty strong I'd ridden him four or five years prior to that and when he was a a lot younger and, and he I still liked him. He he really bucked and so I got on him and and ended up riding him and winning the second in the rodeo and and uh, that's the last one I got on after that. And I told Sandy, my wife, I said, when I get to the point that I think it's time to quit, I'll hang it up and I won't ever get it down again and and so that's what that's what I did. I just decided could have gone on to the old timers rodeos, but you know I kind of went out on a high note and thought, well, I can, I'll just quit right here. And so I haven't, and I I don't regret that either. Uh, I was thirty eight years old the last one I got on, and that's pretty old for a bull rider, but. I got to meet a lot of guys, you know. I got to meet a lot of people in that in that area that were sure enough good bull riders, and they're you know still today they're kind of legends in the bull riding business. Ronnie Roach and a lot of guys like that that raise bulls. That uh, Ronnie was he got killed, but he rode a lot of bulls and raised a lot of bulls that went on to the NFR and different places. And good guy, good bull rider. So, like I say, I wouldn't take for the memories, but I just don't want to do it anymore. Well, you know, Andy, I, I mentioned earlier about the camaraderie of that I felt like goes as far back as the as the trail drive days, and and I ran on to this particular poem in a book called The Trail Drivers of Texas. And when I, when I saw the poem, The Good Old Cowboy Days, I thought, well, I'm going to get to read about stampedes and river crossings and all the dangers of, of the trail. But in reality, it wasn't that way. It was about the camaraderie that those men forged in those days. And... And so that might be a good one. I'd like to recite it if if it's okay, because that's that's kind of what <clears throat> what we were talking about earlier. So please do. It's written by a man by the name of Luther A. Lahan, and he ended up being the secretary for the Trail Driver Association. And they compiled stories from those old trail drivers and put them into a book and they sold that book to make money to erect a monument in at the old trail drivers association museum and so uh it's well there's another poem in there randy Riemann pointed that out to me. there's another poem in there but this poem is the one that really stuck in my mind simply because of of what what they were trying to say, what they were trying to do uh, after the, those days were gone. So this is uh, by Luther A. Lahon. 
My fancy drifts as often through the murky, misty maze of the past, uh, of the seasons, to the good old cowboy days. When the grass was green and waving and the skies was soft and blue and the men was brave and loyal, the women fair and true. The old-time cowboy hears to him from the hired hand to the boss his soul was free from envy and his heart was free from dross. And deep within his nature, which was rugged, high, and bold, there ran a vein of metal, and the metal men was gold. While he'd stand up drunk or sober again a thousand for his rights, he'd sometimes close an argument by shooting out the lights. And if there was a killing by the quickest on the draw, he weren't disposed to quibble about the majesty of law. But a thief, a low-down villain, why he had no use for him, was mighty apt to leave him dangling from a handy limb. He was healed and always ready, quick with pistol or with knife, but he never shirked a danger or a duty in his life. And at a tale of sorrow or of innocence beguiled, his heart was just as tender as the heart of any child. And woman... Ah, her honor was a sacred thing, and hence he threw his arms around her in a figurative sense. His home was yours where it was, and open stood the door whose hinges never closed upon the needy or the poor. Higher low, it mattered not the time, if night or day, a stranger found a welcome just as long as he would stay. He was honest to the marrow, and his bond was in his word. He paid for every critter that he cut into his herd. And take your note, because he loaned a friend a little pelf? No, sir, indeed, he thought you was as worthy as himself. And when you came and paid it back as proper was and meet, you trod upon forbidden ground to ask for a receipt. In former case, you paid the debt, there weren't no interest due, and in the latter, chances are he had put a hole through you. Uh, the old-time cowboy had his faults, tis true as has been said. He'd look upon the liquor when the liquor men was read. And his language weren't always spoke according to the rule, nor was it such as you'd expect to hear in Sunday school. But when he went to meeting men, he'd never yawn nor doze, nor sat there taking notice of the congregation's clothes. He listened to the preacher with respect and all of that. He never failed to any when they passed around the hat. I called to mind the tournament and then the ball at night of how old Porter drawed the bow and sawed with all his might and how they danced the boys and girls and how that one was there with rosy cheeks and hazel eyes and golden curly hair. Ah, oh, but now I'm touching on a mighty tender spot that boyhood love at this late date had better be forgot. But still my memory takes me back again and fondly strays amidst those dear remembered scenes, the good old cowboy days. The old-time cowboy was a man all over, do you hear me, men? I somehow kind of figure we'll not see his like again. The few that's left are older now, their hair is mostly white, their forms are not so active, and their eyes are not so bright. As when the grass was waving green, the skies was soft and blue, and the men was brave and loyal, the women fair and true. And the range was filled with plenty, the range was free to graze, and we all rode as brothers. In the good old cowboy days. Luther A. Lahan, 1903. All right, folks, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank Jay Snyder for taking the time to visit with me. 
I'd like to thank Hal Cannon for playing the Cowboy Crossroads theme music. You can find out more about Hal at halcannon.com. I'd like to thank my Trail Boss patrons, Bob Kelly, Chris Ryden, and Scott Anderson for their support of this episode. If you're enjoying Cowboy Crossroads and would like to help me keep it going, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cowboycrossroads. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash cowboycrossroads. Or you can make a donation on my website at andyhedges.com. If you'd like to contact me with a question or a comment or a story, I'd love to hear from you. Send an email to andy at andyhedges.com. Thank you for listening to Cowboy Crossroads. Cowboy Crossroads.